Okay, so good afternoon. Let's start. So um, I will just proceed. So now I will first talk about prime ideals and maximal ideals. So these are two very simple uh, concepts. So I will, uh, from now on, for simplicity, assume that our ring Uh, when I talk about a ring and I don't say anything else, uh, then a ring, uh, by saying a ring, I mean a commutative ring with one. So, I mean, that means usually from now on we only look at commutative rings with one, and uh, I don't specifically say it. If, if a ring is not commutative with one, then I will say it, okay? So it doesn't mean I've changed the definition of a ring. No, I just, it's just how I simplify this. So, <coughs> um, so prime ideals and maximal ideals are maybe the uh, nicest ideals you can have. <coughs> so you can see this by looking at the quotient by the ideal. So prime ideal will be an ideal such, such that if you take the quotient of the ring divided by a prime ideal, you get an integral domain. And uh, so it has no zero divisors. And if you take the quotient of a ring by a maximal ideal, it will be a field. The quotient will be a field. So the definition, obviously, however, is in terms of the ideal itself. So let me write it. So, uh, so we take a ring, be a ring. So I say commutative ring with one. So an ideal, say P in R, will be called a prime ideal if it has the property that whenever the product of two elements of R lies in the ideal, then one of the two elements already lies there. So if um, whenever, whenever we have A times B is an element of P for A and B elements of R, uh, we have a in P or B in P. Note that by the de definition of an ideal, if uh, we have a product of two elements in the ring, one of which lies in the ideal, then the product lies in the ideal. So, but now for prime ideal, also the converse holds. Okay, so this is the definition. And so, for instance, as an example, So in uh, the integer z, z uh, if p is a prime number, then the ideal p, which is the same as pz, is a prime ideal. Basically, <coughs> so the Elements here are all uh, numbers divisible by p. And uh, a product of two integers is divisible by a prime number if and only if at least one of them is. Okay. Now let's come to the definition of a maximal ideal. Um, so a maximal ideal is, you know, as the name says, you know, an ideal which is maximal, so which is not contained in a bigger ideal, except for the whole ring. So, so uh, an ideal M in a ring R 
is called the maximal ideal. So, maybe just write maximal. If there is no ideal, I, which is, you know, in R, which lies strictly between um, M and R. So, with M is contained in I and really smaller, and this, okay. So, the only ideal of R in which it is, which in which the maximal ideal is contained is R itself. And now I want to um, state the thing which I said in the beginning, the characterization in terms of the quotient of maximal and prime ideals. It's a rather simple fact. Maybe, well, I still, maybe I just call it proposition. So we have R, a ring. So a commutative ring with one. So first, an ideal P in R is a prime ideal. Is a prime ideal if the quotient, if and only if the quotient R mod P is an integral domain. So that means it has no zero divisors. That's essentially a direct reformulation of this, of the definition, as we will see. And um, <coughs> an ideal M in R is a maximal ideal if and only if the quotient is a field. Okay. <coughs> so that also, we will use this uh, quite often later when we want to make field extensions. So we want to find, for a given field, we want to find a bigger field in which the field is contained. So we will take some uh, ring, which is a polynomial ring, and we co quotient by a certain maximal ideal, and the quotient will be another field. So, and we will see that later when we talk about fields. So <coughs> let's um, prove it. So uh, the first one is uh, essentially completely trivial. It's just a reformulation. So we have assumed that R is a commutative ring with one. So that's part of the definition of an integral domain. The only thing that we need, it has no zero devices. No? We have to see. R uh, has no, well, and let me just see like this, commute to ring with one. So that then thus it follows also R uh, mod P. So I do part one is commutative with one. No, this, uh, I mean, the product structure, the, the one here is the class of the one of before, and uh, so. Now, let's take, so, if we're given A and B in R, we know that the class of A will be equal to zero if and only if A is an element of P. No, this is the class, so by this I mean the class of A 
in R mod P. Okay, this is by definition. And so if I take the product of two elements in the quotient, this by definition is this. And so this will be equal to zero. This is equal to zero if and only if uh, A times B is in P. So, <clears throat> I mean, these are all obvious things. So, thus, we find that A is a zero divisor if and only if, if and only if, a is not in P, which means that A is not zero. A zero divisor is a non-zero element, a non-zero multiple of which, uh, so it's a non-zero element which we multiply with another non-zero element to get zero. And there exists another B in R without P, uh, such that AB is in uh, <coughs> is in P. So that means R has zero divisors. So R. So that means R has zero divisors if and only if there exists elements A and B in R without P such that they're probabilized in P. So that means if and only if P is not a prime idealist. And so this is equivalently to saying that it has no zero divisors if and only P is a prime ideal. And so this proves part one. Now, second one is slightly more interesting. So first we will see, so, so assume, so, so if, so if, assume that M is an ideal such that R mod M is a field. Okay. Then it follows, as R mod M is a field, that the only ideals in R mod M are the zero ideal and the whole of R mod M. So <clears throat> we had this statement that, therefore, if we take a quotient, there was a bijection between the ideals containing. So if we <clears throat> take a ring and divide it by some ideal M, then there's a bijection between the ideals in R which contain M and the ideals uh, in R mod M. So the statement then says, that this is equivalent. So the, the ideals in R which contain M are precisely the inverse images of these two. So it means this statement is equivalent to the only ideals in uh, R which contain M are M and uh, ah. And by definition, this is precisely the definition of a maximal ideal. So in particular, if we follow this, we have seen that if R mod M is a field, then M is a maximal ideal. And we find it is equivalent if we can reverse this step. No, because these two are equivalents, but here 
we have to see that this step is also an equivalent. So therefore, so thus, it's enough to prove the following lemma. which is actually also quite simple. So let R be a commutative ring with one. So let R be a ring. Um, whose only ideals are the zero ideal and R. So with zero and R is only ideals. Well, then we have to see that it's, it is a field. Well, this is, <coughs> so what does it mean? If you have a commutative ring with one to be a field, it means that every non-zero element must be a unit. So it must have a multiplicative inverse. So we have to see that. So in order to prove this statement, we have to take an element A in R, a non-zero element A in R, and we have to see that uh, it has an inverse. So that A, uh, let's say there exists in B in R such that AB is equal to 1. Well. Now we have to somehow connect this to these, uh, to these ideals because here we only have a statement about ideals. So the only ideal we can make out of our element A is obviously the ideal generated by A. So this is an ideal. And um, obviously A is contained in this ideal. So it's not equal to the zero ideal. But the only ideals in R are 0 and the whole of R. So thus, the ideal generated by A is equal to R. So in particular, we have that 1 is an element of A. But you, know, you have to remember, what is A? The ideal generated by an element is just the set of all A, B, such that B is in R. So in other words, it means, so thus, there exists a B in R, such that AB equal to 1. And so we have found our inverse. As you see, it's quite uh, simple. So, so in some sense, <coughs> it's almost a reformulation of the definition of maximal and prime ideal that the quotient in one case is a field, in the other case, an integral domain. But uh, as we shall see, this statement with these, uh, as already mentioned, this, this kind of statement that if you have a maximal ideal, then the quotient by it is a field will be a method to construct new fields. Where am I? So as a, as a corollary, we find that every, I mean, it would be easy anyway, but every prime ideal, every maximal ideal is a prime ideal. Now we know that um, uh, if I take the quotient by a maximal ideal, it is a field. A field is in particular an integral domain. So it's uh, so the ideal was also prime ideal by this uh, by the first part of the statement. So <clears throat> okay, now we want to look at um, 
very particular rings, which are just polynomial rings over a field, which will later interest us when we also do field extension in Galois theory. So maybe I can start here. So, so let small k be a field. And we want to study the polynomial ring kx. So, so kx is the polynomial ring which we had introduced before. We had introduced the polynomial ring with coefficients uh, in any ring. And now we have to do it in particular if k is a field. What? what? This problem, if it makes no idea with the polynomial, I think it holds only in a ring which is a union with anything. Uh, I haven't thought about it. <laughs> yeah, I know every, we, we at, at first okay, we assume that every ring is a union with unity. You know? Yeah. yeah. This glory as a statement can just add something. Every maximal idea in a in a linear ring with you is is a final idea for it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have not thought about you know the. <clears throat> you know, I, I expect you know I I don't expect you know I I haven't thought about but I don't expect it to be true if the ring is not commutative with one. But you know I. I yeah. Anyway, so I. No, as a statement. Are you so so? But I mean, okay. If you want, uh, so. In, but you know, I have made this general assumption, so this statement implies that. But in, in a commutative ring, so. Ring, with, one. Okay, so if that makes you. Uh, feel more at ease, I can do that. Okay, so we look at this polynomial ring and we will actually be, we want to study this polynomial ring kx of polynomials with coefficients in k more carefully. In particular, we will be interested in questions of divisibility. So when one polynomial is divisible by another. And so before doing this, I want to introduce generally, so study divisibility. of polynomials. This will be, actually, most likely this will be a review of something that you have learned in high school, but at any rate, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, we want to have it uh, in our language. So first, then, I introduce divisibility in general for, for any integral domain. So definition so let R be an integral domain. So then we take uh, two elements, A, B in R. We say that A, you know, it, it's the obvious definition, A divides B in R, uh, which is denoted a divides b. Um, if the obvious thing holds, you know, there exists an element c in R such that a times c is equal to b. Okay, that's not very uh, surprising as a definition. And otherwise, um, we see, so if there's no such c, uh, then we say that a does not divide B, obviously, and we don't otherwise, and we write it as A does not divide B. Okay. And uh, there are some obvious properties. Uh, so 
So, for instance, we have that. Um, so, A, so obvious properties. So, by definition, A divides B if and only if B is an element of the ideal generated by A. And uh, well, and so in, we also have that, uh, and it follows from this that if A divides B and B divides C, then it follows that A divides C. Yeah, that's also trivial from the definition. And if A divides B and A divides C, then it follows that A divides A uh, B plus C. Okay, so obviously there's nothing to say. This is completely obvious from the definition. Um, <clears throat> now, for the divisibility of polynomial, we ha I have to kind of remind you of uh, R1. So you, <clears throat> of something that, as I said, you learned at school. You first learned it for the integers. If you have two integers, you can divide one integer by another with the rest. No, whatever. Seven is equal to one times five plus two. And uh, you can also do it for polynomials. You know, you, I think, uh, uh, most like, I mean, I'm pretty sure that you have uh, made such computations of dividing one polynomial by another, and then sometimes there was a rest by the typical uh, algorithm, which is sometimes called the uh, what's that? <laughs> sometimes called the Euclidean algorithm, but uh, I will reserve that name for something else. So we have the so the <coughs> so the divisibility of polynomials is governed. Or, you know, you can check it uh, by the algorithm of division with rest. That I think you must have all seen. I, however, you know, formulated uh, kind of precisely and prove that it works. So theorem, this is division with rest, so let's take two polynomials with coefficients in a k, so k is still our field, and we assume that the second one is not zero, so not the polynomial, you know, which just is the constant polynomial zero. So then there exists unique polynomials um, Q in Kx. This stands somehow for the quotient. And R in Kx which would be the rest, uh, such that we can write f, uh, f equal to q times g plus r. No? Um, and uh, the r has smaller degree than g. The, um, and the degree of R is smaller than the degree of G. Well, or R is equal to zero. Now, by definition, if you have the zero polynomial, it doesn't really have a degree. I mean, I could say the zero polynomial has degree minus one, then this would always hold. Okay. Okay. So this is the statement. And you prove this by, you know, dividing with rest by the usual algorithm. But I 
want to prove this by a, Induct, an inductive argument which also tells you again what the algorithm is. So if, um, so we make some kind of induction. So if our polynomial f is equal to zero or the degree of f is uh, smaller than the degree of g, well, then we are already done. No? We can just put q equal to zero and r is equal to f. And uh, trivially, it's fine. So this is somehow the beginning of the induction. So if um, the degree of f is bigger than the degree of g, then we proceed by induction. On the, num on the degree of f, which I want to call m. And so we have to somehow find a way to replace f by something of lower degree and use the statement for that. And we basically just you know, do the obvious thing. We subtract the leading coefficient, <coughs> the leading term. So let's see. So, so let A be the leading coefficient of F. So to just remind you, uh, so if uh, F, say, has degree M, then this means it's the coefficient of, A, of X to the M. Huh? and uh, b, the leading coefficient of g. And we write down another polynomial, which I call maybe f bar, which is just, we subtract a suitable uh, multiple of uh, g from f in order to, to lower the degree, so let's see. We take f minus uh, a divided by b times x to the m minus the degree of f of g times g. Now, the degree of uh, g we know is smaller or equal to m because that was our assumption here. So this is a positive number. So this thing is actually polynomial with coefficients in k. So this is an element in kx. And um, this is a polynomial of degree m. This is a polynomial of degree m because this had the, the degree uh, m minus the degree of g. And then we, this had the, the, degree, the degree of g. And then it says, and we multiply it by x to the m minus degree of g, so the degree becomes degree of g. So we have two polynomials of degree m. So it follows that f bar has at least at most degree m. So we have the degree of f bar. So is smaller or equal to m. And uh, to, in order to check whether it's m or smaller, we have to see what the what the uh, coefficient of x to the m in f bar is, whether it's zero or not. So let's compute it. So the coefficient of x to the m in f bar is what? Well, so we just compute it here. Here it is the coefficient of x to the m in f, which is a minus a divided by b the coefficient of x to the m of this thing, which is the same as the coefficient of, as the leading coefficient here, times this. So this is a divided by b times b. And so this is zero. So thus, the degree of f bar is strictly smaller than m. 
or maybe f bar is also zero. So therefore, we can, uh, by induction, we can deduce that f bar has such a, you know, can be written in this way. We have that f bar is equal, say, to q prime times g plus r prime with uh, the degree of q prime um, is, uh, say, whatever, what is what I wanted with, uh, no, I don't know, with uh, such that, the, that uh, either r prime is equal to zero or the degree of r prime is smaller than the degree of g. Well, now I just put the r that I wanted to find here to be r prime and the g E, the Q equal to Q prime plus, uh, where did I write it? Plus this thing, A divided by B, X to the M minus C degree of G. Then by definition, I mean by what we have just defined here, we find that obviously our prime still fulfills this condition, and uh, we have that f is equal to q g plus r, and we are done. Okay, <clears throat> so this is the division with rest, and um, so, uh, ah, so I should maybe say, I have said there exists a unique such thing. So what I've proven here is first the existence, okay? And so I still have to prove the uniqueness, but that's kind of trivial. So assume we can write this thing in two different ways. So assume f is equal to qg plus r and it's also equal to q prime g plus r prime. Now these are different ones with the same assumptions as before that these are polynomials and the degree of r and the degree of r prime, so, so, so r comma r prime is equal to zero or no, well. So for each r and r prime it holds that either they are zero or the degree is smaller than the degree of g as before. So then we have that, so these things are equal. So I can take the difference. So zero is equal to Q minus Q prime times G. I take the difference of these uh, plus R minus R prime. Or in other words, uh, R minus R prime is equal to Q minus Q prime times G. So if, um, if Q is different from Q prime, then it follows that the degree of Q minus Q prime is bigger or equal to zero. And so the degree, you know, is mult if you take the product of two polynomials, the degree is multiplicative. So it follows the degree of R minus R prime is bigger equal to zero times the degree of G. But this is impossible because both R and R prime have degrees smaller than degree of G. So this is a contradiction. 
So thus, uh, Q is equal to Q prime. But now if Q is equal to Q prime, then you know, R is just F minus this, and the same for R prime, so also R is equal to R prime. Okay, so this is simple. And um, as I said, if you look at uh, how we prove this thing, we actually see that we have given an algorithm for uh, making the division with rest. And the algorithm is precisely the one you learned at school. So if we take uh, so the proof gives an algorithm. No, just the induction step is just one step in the algorithm uh, for division with rest. So we can just uh, do it if we have something like, I don't know, x to the 3 plus 4x plus 4x squared plus x plus 1. And we want to divide it by x plus 2. So, so we want to compute the division with rest of this. So we have to find, uh, you know, so x squared times the quotient of these two uh, leading coefficients. So this is, uh, we get, this is fx squared. So this is, gives, so we subtract this thing, x to the 3 plus 2x squared. So the difference will be 2x squared plus x plus 1. Now we have here 2x squared and you have x. So we have to take 2x. And so we subtract now 2x times this. So this is 2x squared plus 4x. OK? And so if we subtract it, what do we get? We get minus 3x plus 1. And so in order to get, we have here minus 3. And so this gives a minus 3x minus 6. And the difference is 7. So the rest is 7. So this is how you, you know, one does this division with rest. I mean, I think you have done this many times. It's also the same way how you do it with numbers. OK. Now, when we, we have been talking about divisors, so we can also talk about common divisors and greatest common divisors. So let me define what greatest common divisors is and then use the uh, Euclidean, uh, this uh, division with rest to uh, <coughs> compute the greatest common divisor of two polynomials. So definition, so R is in, say maybe still an integral domain. And uh, we assume we have some elements, E1 or En, some elements in R. So, so an element R in R will be called a common divisor if it divides them all. Well, if A divides, if uh, R, well, uh, so this was AN, divides AI for all I equals 1 to N. And the greatest common divisor is uh, one which is, in a suitable sense, the largest of all common divisors. And this actually means that every common divisor has to divide it. So a common divisor which is divided by all other common divisors. So R in R is called 
a greatest common divisor if it is a co uh, of a1 to n if it is a common divisor and every common divisor of a1 to a n will divide r. Then S divides R. Okay. So for instance, the greatest common divisor in of four and six will be two in the integers. Okay, so um, where are we? So uh, it's clear by definition that the greatest common divisor is almost unique. It's not completely unique, but it's unique up to multiplying by a unit. So we mark greatest common divisors are unique up to multiplying by unit. No, if uh, you have two greatest common divisors, S and R, then S divides R and R divides S, which means, which implies that S must be R multiplied by unit. So now, in our polynomial ring Kx, we use this division with rest to compute uh, the greatest, so a greatest common divisor. So, so in Kx, use division with rest. This actually would also work in the integers with rest uh, to compute a greatest common divisor. How does that go? So again, we take, um, so this is the following remark. So let uh, F and G be two polynomials. And uh, we assume that uh, G is maybe they are both non-zero, whatever. Anyway, two non-zero polynomials. Now, I write also R zero for F, R one for G, and we make division with rest. So we divide F by G with rest. So. We write um, uh, F, so by division with rest, we have um, uh, F, which is also a zero, is equal to uh, Q1 times G plus R2, so R2 is the rest dividing F by G, or to put it in this form, we have R0 is equal to Q1 times R1 plus R2. And now we reiterate this with R1 and R2. So we put, um, so with the, um, so where, you know, as before, we have that uh, the degree of R2 is smaller than the degree 
of G, which is R1, or R2 is equal to 0. And now <coughs> we can reiterate this. So inductively, we um, uh, define, so I maybe can, so I, I do it once more, so I can say that R1 is equal to uh, Q2 times R2 plus R3 with uh, degree of R3 is smaller than the degree of R2 or R3 is equal to 0. This actually only obviously works if R2 is not equal to 0, otherwise it stops here. And so inductively, we have uh, R, say, I minus 1 is equal to Q I times R I plus R I plus 1 by division with rest. And the degree of R I plus 1 is smaller than the degree of R I. Or R I plus 1 is equal to 0. So we can inductively define all these polynomials as long as the rest that we get here is non-zero because obviously we cannot divide by zero. So this defines us these polynomials R0, R1, R2, and so on, until Rn, until at the last step, uh, it divides it. You can see this cannot go on forever because the degree gets almost always smaller. So at some point, you, you know, at the worst case, so the degree would become negative if it would go forever, which is not possible. So at some point, it must be that the rest is zero. So this procedure stops. If um, so, at some point, when say r n minus one for some n r n minus one is equal to q n times r n, and the rest is zero. Uh, r n, I don't know. So there, at some point, we will have this. And now the claim is that this last. So the rest of the previous div division, so this last one we get here, is, the, is a common divisor. So claim is the greatest common divisor. Rn is a greatest common divisor. Of f and g. in Kx. So, you know, now we just have to uh, prove that it's first a common divisor and then that every other common divisor divides it. And we do this somehow out of this procedure. Where am I? So we have always this equation. Uh, so we have always have this sequence of equations um, here. Yeah, uh, I minus one is equal to QI RI plus RI plus one. So. <coughs> If we start here, we first start with this one. This one says that Rn divides Rn minus 1. No? So we want to first show, so first show um, Rn is a common divisor. Of f and g. So we see by definition we have that Rn divides Rn minus 1 by this last equation. No. Yes. And um, then we can look at the next one. We have, uh, if we look Rn minus 2, 
is equal to q i minus one q n minus one uh, n minus one plus uh, n. So here you see that R n divides these two, and so it divides R n minus two. So thus R n divides R n minus two. And so if we go to the next step, you know, at each step we will have that, you know, if we go one further, we have that R uh, n divides this one and this one, therefore it divides this one. So inductively, we have uh, uh, n divides uh, i plus 1, and uh, n divides uh, i. Thus it follows uh, i divides uh, i minus 1. So it follows that Rn divides all the Ri, and so in particular it divides R0, which is F, and R1, which is G. Rn, what's what? Rn divides R0, uh, divides all Ri, and therefore Rn divides R0, which is F, and Rn divides R1, which is G. So it is a common divisor. And now we want to see it is a greatest common divisor. And here we have kind of, to prove it's a common divisor, we started kind of from the bottom, from the Rn, and then we worked our way up. And to prove it's the greatest common divisor, we start from the top and work our way down through these equations. So um, to see, so let S be a common divisor <coughs> of F and G. In order to show it's the greatest common divisor, we have to see that S divides Rn. Okay, so S divides F and G. So that means S divides F, which is R0, and S divides G, which is R1. No? And now we have defined, we had that uh, R0 is equal to, say, Q1 times R1 plus R2. So S divides this one, and S divides this one. So it divides also the difference, which is R2. So it follows that S divides R2. And now, inductively, we have this, that we have uh, I minus 1 is equal to QI RI plus What's wrong? Um, and we know, and inductively, we know that S divides uh, I minus 1 and S divides Ri. So it divides this term and this term, so it divides the difference, which is Ri plus 1. So again, we find that S divides all the I I. S divides all R I, in particular, S divides R N, and therefore R N is the greatest common divisor. So this method of um, finding the greatest common divisor is sometimes called the Euclidean algorithm. Sometimes also just the division with rest is called the Euclidean algorithm. 
Anyway, um, so supposedly it's, uh, you know, I think it must be written down in the elements of Euclid, so it's not the newest of all. Uh, maybe just for integers, though. Okay. So I want to use this to give a, I mean, as a consequence, I want to prove something which doesn't look very exciting at all, um, which, however, we will use later to prove a very important theorem, is a theorem of the primitive element. So it's a, it's a rather trivial fact, which, however, we will want to use for something important. The statement is the following. Let K be a field. And let uh, small k be a subfield. So that just means that k is a field, and small k is a field, and small k is a subring of the large k. And um, uh, K is a subring of K. Okay, so we make this assumption. And as a side remark, we uh, note, I maybe should have written it before. Maybe I state the corollary afterwards. So note that in this case, if you take the polynomial ring with coefficients in k, in small k, this will be is a subring um, of the polynomial ring with coefficients in the large k. No? That's clear. If you take product of any two polynomials with coefficients in small k, it will lie here, but it obviously, so this is uh, obvious. So now the corollary under these assumptions So let's take f and g to be two polynomials with coefficients in the larger field, kx. And we form, uh, so the greatest common divisor of these two polynomials is not unique, but we can, um, but it's unique up to multiplying by a unit. So uh, let H be a greatest common divisor of um, I'm now wondering whether what I say is correct. Let me just check. No, no. Okay. So actually, I just take the polynomial here. So now I take the greatest common divisor of these two polynomials as polynomials in the larger field. So, I mean, in principle, uh, you know, in the larger field, the, you know, the, in this there are, you know, more common divisors, and there might be more greatest common divisors. So, if the leading coefficient of H is an element in the smaller k, small k, then h is a polynomial in small kx. Now, this is almost completely trivial, as we also will see from the proof. Um, but at least in theory, if you just think of it, uh, if, you, you know, if you have a ring with two elements, 
in a ring, you take their greatest common divisor in a ring, and you take a bigger ring and take their greatest common divisor, they don't need to be equal. No? But here uh, we have a criterion in this particular case. And uh, <coughs> you know, if the ring uh, is bigger, there might be just more elements. But here it is like this. And so just to remind you, I had used this uh, Euclidean algorithm, so division with rest, to compute a greatest common divisor of two polynomials, but it's not unique. It's one way to get the greatest common divisor, but the greatest common divisor is only well-defined up, up to multiplying by a, by a unit. So there are, <coughs> but then we'll now see that this is basically trivial by this Euclidean algorithm. So we do have one greatest common divisor given by the Euclidean algorithm. So let L be the greatest common divisor of F and G uh, computed. So as it is computed, by the Euclidean algorithm. So this division is rest. By the Euclidean algorithm. Algorithm in large Kx. So there's one way how I can compute the greatest common divisor of f and g, I mean one, one instance of it, by just applying this Euclidean algorithm. I get some polynomial. Now, but if you look at it, uh, you just, you know, how do you compute this greatest common divisor? You do it by successively doing division with rest. So if you start with two polynomials in small kx, you stay in small kx. No, it's always you take the rest, dividing one by the other. The fact that the ring in which you kind of think you are is the other kx doesn't affect the algorithm at all. So, um, <coughs> so as uh, L is computed by uh, repeated division with rest, You know, from f and g, it follows that uh, L is a polynomial with coefficients in small k. And now, if I take any greatest common divisor, of f and g, then it follows that, you know, it is equal, kh must be equal to l up to multiplying by a unit. But the units in a polynomial ring are the non-zero constants. No? So it follows that h is equal to a times l for a, an element in k without zero. Well, we can look at the leading coefficients. So we have that uh, hn, the leading coefficient of h, ln, the leading coefficient of l. So then, you know, I just multiply by a constant. I have hn is equal to a times ln. So if this leading coefficient is also in k, then by dividing by this, we find that a is in k. So if hn is in the small k, then it follows that a is in k. And so the polynomial h is obtained from l by multiplying by an element in k, so it lies in kx. 
So I maybe should have called it k and l, but so there's a small k and the big p, k, and this thus uh, we have that uh, h, which is equal to a times l, is in kx, in small kx. So it's uh, very simple, but as I said, we will see that it's actually useful. Um, okay, now we want to, so, so much for this uh, greatest common divisors. Now we want to, um, you know, if you have a polynomial, you can evaluate it at an element in K or at an element in a bigger ring than K, in a ring that contains K. And uh, once you can evaluate it, you can also talk about zeros of the polynomial, namely the elements in, for instance, in K, where the polynomial is zero. So let me uh, do this. So we have we can evaluate. So definition. So we have. Um, so let f be equal to sum i equal zero to n a i x to the i be a polynomial with coefficients in k, and say let r be a ring that contains uh, k as subring. So ring here again means commutative with one. What? What? K is a field, yeah. So so I so K is always a field in the whole story. So small you know, I, I started in the beginning that K was a field and KX was a polynomial ring with uh, but so I mean I don't really need that here, let K be a field. Okay. But I had all the time assumed that K was a field, no? And R is a ring. So then so so for an element S in R, we can define f of S. Well, it just means you replace uh, the variable x by the element S. And this x to the i means really my multiplying S i times with itself. So sum i equals 0 to n, a i s to the i. So this is an element in R. <coughs> Okay, so we can take the value of f uh, at any element in this ring R, in particular at any point in K. <coughs> and so, uh, obviously, you know, as this is all the structure here with multiplication is compatible with this, if we take this, the sum of two polynomials, and we evaluate it at s, this will be equal to f of s plus g of s. Because the sum is just by adding the corresponding coefficients, and so it does the same. And the product of polynomials is defined in such a way that if I take the product of two polynomials and evaluate at s, this is f of s times g of s. This is why one had this uh, crazy definition. Huh? So, we see that evaluating at the point S is actually a ring homomorphism. So, so thus, I could call it the evaluation at S from uh, Kx to uh, R, which sends uh, a polynomial F to F of S, is a ring homomorphism. So we have, um, uh, which you know, one would call the evaluation at S. So for the moment, 
we will use this evaluation only for S action element of, of our K. But later, we will uh, do it in other, also evaluate in other rings, in particular in bigger fields. I just introduce it generally here. So now, if we have that, so an element, say S in R, will be called a zero of our polynomial if f of s is equal to 0. No? So if, it's, if this is a 0 element in R. OK. And now, <clears throat> now we, so this was general, we have this R. Now we go back to just having k. Uh, so take S in K. So then the first uh, not very surprising result that I want to show you is that if an element A in K is a zero of F, then F is divisible by X minus A. I mean, this is a very exciting new result. And uh, <clears throat> then we will use this fact to prove that if you have a polynomial in Kx, then the number of zeros it has in K can be, at most, the degree of the polynomial. Okay, and it's quite easy to see how one would prove that from this. So maybe I call well, proposition. Uh, so let F be a polynomial in Kx. Um, <coughs> So maybe, well, I don't know. I think it even holds like that. So let's be polynomial in Kx and A in K. Uh, then then uh, A is a zero of F, if and only if X minus A divides F in Kx. So that means that we can write f equal to x minus a times g, where g is an element, is another polynomial in kx. OK, <clears throat> so let's see how we can prove this difficult result. Well, you know, the only thing we know is division with rest, so we do division with rest. Um, so maybe first we do the trivial direction, and then we do the almost trivial one. So, so if x minus a divides f, so then we have uh, f is equal to x minus a times g. And so, if I take uh, uh, f of a, then we can just put a for x. This is uh, a minus a times g of a. And obviously, this is 0, so this is 0. So, <clears throat> um, uh, so, this direction is clear. So now let's look at the other one. For this, we use division with rest. So we assume that uh, f of a is equal to 0 for some a in k. So now we make division with rest by x minus a. So we have f is equal to x minus a times uh, what? Some g plus some rest. And the rest is either 0 or its degree is smaller than the degree of x minus a, which is 1. So 
that means r is equal to zero or r is a constant polynomial of uh, a non-zero constant polynomial. It means uh, that r is an element in k. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, now we again, but we know, now we can compute f of a, which we know, happen to know it's zero. Again, uh, we, have already, we already know how to compute f of a, you know, compute such a product. This is a minus a times g of a plus r of a, but r is constant, so it's just r. So this part is zero. So it means that r is equal to zero. And therefore, we find that indeed uh, x minus e a divides g. Okay. And now, um, um, so as a corollary, we find this fact that uh, the polynomial of degree n can have as most n zeros. So let uh, think f be a polynomial coefficients in x, which is not the zero polynomial. Then f has at most degree of f zeros in k. Well, you know, that's, uh, I mean, obviously from what we have here, that's trivial induction, essentially. So if whenever we have a zero, we divide the a, we divide by x minus a until we are left with nothing. So we make induction on the degree of f. So if the degree of f is equal to zero, then f is a constant polynomial, and it's a non-zero constant polynomial. f is a non-zero constant, therefore it has no zeros, no, because it's always the same. So that case is okay. So the degree is zero. The number of zeros is also zero. Okay, now we make the induction step. So let f, f degree, n plus one for some number n. So now we want to show that f has at most as many zeros. So we start at least by saying, so if f has no zeros, you know, then obviously our statement is true, okay? Then we are done. So we can assume that f has a zero. So thus assume a in k is a zero. Of f. Well, then obviously what we want to do is divide by x minus a because we know f is divisible by it. Then f is equal to x minus a times g, where g is a polynomial in kx, and the degree of g is one less than the degree of f. Okay. Thus, we know that g has at most n zeros.
by induction. And so if, say, P is a zero of F, then we have F of P is equal to zero, which is P minus A times G of P. Now, if A is different from B, so is the zero of F different from from A, then this is non-zero. So it follows that G of B is equal to zero. So thus, F had, has at most n plus one zero, namely all the zeros of G, and in addition, A. Okay, so this is um, in K. So this was a rather simple thing. Let me see how many minutes I have. Uh, so this was um, the end of this section. It's not quite clear. Um, I think if uh, if it's fine with you, I would stop now because I you know, wouldn't. What? What does it mean? Yeah, it's, uh, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, so, but then another time I will maybe get it back with uh, interest. And so uh, I will stop now. Thank you. <laughs> so I don't want to start a new chapter now. So. <laughs>